Chinese couple have a baby. The doctor gives the newborn to the father. The father looks into the sweet brown eyes of the baby. This baby's so adorable. But just then he notices something wrong. The baby has black skin and curly hair. The doctor asks him about the new baby's name, and the father says, I, I think we should call him Sum Ting Wong. <laughs> Something wrong. That must have been how good King Josiah felt. Twenty five hundred years ago. When the high priest of the temple came to him with a book. He'd never seen it before. No one had seen it before in Josiah's lifetime. No one had seen it for at least sixty years. A whole generation. People had forgotten. It was the book of Moses. It was the book of Moses. During routine temple repair, they had stumbled upon the old book. And they brought it. King Josiah. Now, in that intervening 60 years, they'd forgotten all about everything. The Ten Commandments, their covenant responsibilities, they, they had forgotten to worship just the one God and other gods were now had set up shop in Jerusalem. In fact, on the Temple Mount itself was a, was a, was a, a temple to uh, the fertility god, Ashtoreth, where unspeakable things were done. Portions of the book were read to Josiah. Josiah heard the Ten Commandments for the first time. Josiah heard the covenant between God and his people, Israel, for the first time. You know the covenant, where God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And here's how everyone will know that you're my people, if you keep the Ten Commandments. (laughs) Josiah quickly realized that something was wrong. The people didn't keep the Ten Commandments. They didn't even know them. The people were not living out the covenant, a relationship with God. They didn't even know about it. And he cried out. He tore his clothes, and he went off by himself to to pray. And the first thing he did was to tell God how sorry he was for himself and for his people. And he promised God to be faithful to keeping the Ten Commandments, no matter what changes had to happen in his life and in the life of the nation. Then Josiah gathered all the people together so they could hear the law of God proclaimed. And and, and Josiah led the nation in a period of repentance and renewal. And people affirmed the covenant. They promised to obey the Ten Commandments, and they changed their behavior. All the foreign gods were kicked out of town. Greed was put in check, and all bad behavior was banned. Furthermore, the people re-pledged themselves to being God's people and bringing the light of truth and goodness to the whole world. Isn't that a wonderful story? Isn't that a wonderful story? It's in 2 Kings 22 and 23. It's a beautiful story. Ah, but it's more than a story. It's our story. You see, we are Christians. Our story goes, includes, but goes beyond the Ten Commandments. We have before us the good news of Jesus Christ. God's heart and God's will have been made plain to us in the teaching and the life and the work of Jesus. When we hear the message that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, When we are impacted by the teachings of Jesus as found in the Sermon on the Mount and in his parables, then we cannot but look at our own lives and say, something's wrong. When we wake up to the awful incongruity between our priorities and values and the priorities and values of the gospel, should we be any less distressed than King Josiah? Think of our selfishness. Think of our self-centeredness, our lack of respect for the things of God. Think of the constant refrain that we sing that goes, what's in it for me? Don't these things grate on your soul like 
fingernails running down a chalkboard. I used to hate that sound. I had a teacher who I, got us to stop talking that way. He'd just run his fingernails down. Everyone got real quiet. Think about it. Isn't that kind of what happens when we realize this incongruity between our attitudes and behaviors and the things that God wants and expects from us? God calls us to be tender-hearted, and yet we don't even see those with pain and hurt all around us. God calls us to love our neighbor, and yet we don't even know our neighbor's names. <laughs> God calls us to work for goodness and justice in this world, and yet good works and attitudes of being of service to one another and to strangers are rare, and injustices proliferate. Do you know that young women are being kidnapped all over the world and are being peddled for sex right here in the Detroit area. Did you know that? Human trafficking is right here. We don't have to go to Eastern Europe. We don't have to go to uh, Indonesia. We, we don't have to go to any places where you might think it would be. It's right here. And it's not enough to refrain from participating. What are we going to do to stop this wicked practice? Do you know that cheating and stealing are practically a high art form in our culture today? <laughs> None of the teenagers in this room were there. But there was an occasion when I was with, with a, a group of youth, a group of teens, and I was trying to get across to them a lesson that, that, that cheating is always wrong. And um, so I said to them, oh, tell me, have any of you ever cheated on a test? And this amazing transformation happened. They all started, they all looked at each other and started talking to each other. And I was happy about that. Only this is what they were saying. They were saying, here's how I do it. I do it. I write on my hand. In other words, uh, well, I slip things up. My, and another one was saying, well, here's how I do it. And, and, and it was like, it was like, it was like uh, they, they were sharing, uh, it was like best practices. <laughs> they were sharing their inside information on how to cheat. And it, it was like, this is how ubiquitous it is. It's not enough that we refuse to cheat or to steal. What are we going to do to educate the population around us? What are we going to do about bringing values, I say American values, based on Christian and Judaic values? But these values are in other religions too. Think of the Sikhs. The Sikhs, you know, they have those, those very characteristic turbans and Usually have long hair. They don't cut their hair, and they have long beards. And um, most of them are, are named Doctor Singh. And if you go to a, 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 a Beaumont Hospital, you'll meet about uh, 20 Doctor Singhs because they all have the same last name. <laughs> you know what this? You know what the Sikhs do after they worship the one true and living God every Sunday? After they have their service, you know what they do? They open up their kitchen and their dining room, and they feed not just everybody in the congregation but everyone in the community, anyone who wants to come. They, they feed the homeless, uh, uh, people who don't, uh, who don't maybe have a hot meal during the week, and they're all invited to come and participate. This is what the Sikhs do. Doesn't that make you ashamed that we as Christians, who've heard from Jesus himself, the Son of God, that we are to love and to care for our neighbors, doesn't that make you ashamed Shouldn't we be doing even more than the Sikhs to serve the poor and the communities where we live? I could go on and on with this. So what? Make your point, James. Okay, here it is. My point is that our beliefs must match our actions. Good King Josiah is called good because when he heard the Ten Commandments and he heard the covenant of God, he didn't say, gee, isn't that interesting, and just go on his merry way. He didn't do that. He repented, and he took an action. And his action was to lead. And the people followed. And changes were made that were good and beneficial and just. God is giving us an opportunity personally. You. And he's giving us, as a church family, 
an opportunity to hear again the truth of the gospel. We are called to serve Christ by serving others. We are called to live out faith in the world and to make a difference for God. So the question becomes, what are you going to do about it? Do you have the courage to make some changes in your life? Are you willing to stand up and be counted for Christ? Are you? It's counterculture now, you know. Will you take whatever steps is necessary to change your attitudes and values so that they are more in line with what God wants? When we are baptized, we join the covenant promise. Baptism is more than just a personal confirmation of my faith, a personal witness to my faith. It's more than that. Baptism is joining the covenant, the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the one he proclaimed at that first Lord's Supper. This is the new covenant. And the new covenant it is, I am your God and you will be my people. And here's how everyone will know that you are my people, not just that you keep the Ten Commandments, but that you have faith in your hearts and that that faith plays out in action in the world. This is how you will be my witnesses here. You will teach everything I've commanded and you will baptize in my name. We join that covenant at baptism. It's a promise that we make to not just love God, but to serve God, and to serve God by serving others. It is a promise that we will all be part of the grand 2,000-year-old work to bring the kingdom of God into reality when we live out the kingdom value because they only become real when we live them out. So here's the invitation. What are you going to do? We are about to enter a five-week campaign called Back to Church Sunday Initiative. We're going to be telling everybody that's got any connection with Bethany, we want to have a Back to Church Sunday, along with, I don't know how many other thousands of churches are going to do this, uh, on September 15th, and, and fill Bethany. And, but, it, you know, are you willing to just have the courage enough to just invite your neighbor, your relatives, or your friends to come with you, sit with you? Do you know that most people join Bethany because somebody invited them? <laughs> you know, this is, a, this, is a, this, is a, this is true. Um... We need to invite, and we need to bring, and we need to sit with them. And we're going to have a glorious service that day, and we want them to experience the church and with all of its love and all of its caring and all of its purpose and all of its mission so that they'll understand why church is important in their lives. I wonder, I wonder what you're going to do about it. We're preparing for a safety and security day on September 29th. Our church council uh, uh, thought through all of, what are the ways we can tell the community that we love them and care about them? Here we are sitting, we got this cute sign, but you know, there's very little interaction otherwise with our community. How can we tell the community we love them, we care about them? Well, we're gonna, on September 29th, we've invited the Waterford Police Department, the Waterford uh, Fire Department, they're gonna be here. We're gonna have uh, our, uh, our security company, Acton Alarm's gonna be here to show people about how to be secure. Uh, we're going to have other safety experts here. We're going to have a, a, a bounce house, a balloons. A, 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 we're going to face painting the whole thing and make it a little fair. And uh, we're going to invite the whole community. We're, we're getting ready right now for a publicity uh, surge all over, uh, all over Waterford and the surrounding area. And uh, to just get people on the ground. So we're not going to try to sell them anything. We're going to let them know who we are. But we want them to walk away saying, you know, that church is really part of this community and they really care about us. You know, what are you willing to do about it? Will you do something? Anything? Bite your neighbor? Be part of it? I could go on and on, but you get the point. Our Lord's brother James, the leader of the Jerusalem church in the early days of the Jesus movement, he said it plainly, so we will remember it. Faith without works is dead. Say that with me. Faith without works is dead. Can't get more plain than that. And now it's up to you. What will you do? Will you follow good King Josiah into the closet of prayer and self-examination and repentance? Will you follow him out of the closet of prayer into the world of action? Action that makes a difference? It's up to you, really. I wonder what you will do. I wonder. Shall we pray? 
Dear Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, prick our hearts with the truth of your gospel. Irritate us. Irritate us within to feel the incongruity until we join the King of Kings and his global mission of bringing the reality of the gospel to all people and beginning right here in our Jerusalem, Waterford. Amen. Thank you, friends. Please stand and join me as we sing together uh, number 579, I Surrender All. 579.